Good day, people. This is a fantastic reading by Eric Hoffer. Uh, it's from his book, The Ordeal of Change, and it's called A Playful Mood. And I'd like you to reflect on both of those terms, playful and mood. And, and so mood is a kind of what, you know, it's like an atmosphere of emotion that you happen to be in at a particular moment and that it changes. And it's kind of a question what, you know, you need to do to change your mood. And we have good moods and we have bad moods. And then there's this notion of play. And play is fascinating because play is, in a way, I think he means it to be the opposite of seriousness. And when you think about play, what do you think of? You think of like childhood and you think of games and you think of fun. There's a certain amount of what spontaneity uh, play generally has rules. It's not anything goes. You can't just do whatever you want. And he is advocating here for what he calls a playful mood, which is an approach to kind of what, you know, creativity and existence in a sort of, I don't know, less than a formal or serious way. So Hoffer says this here, he says, we are told that a great life is thought of youth wrought out in ripening years. And it is perhaps equally true that great thinking consists in the working out of insights and ideas which come to us in playful moments. And that, you know, th this idea of, of kind of great and serious thinking and creativity is, while it seems to be kind of serious and formal, it, it's really more a function of just kind of personal enjoyment and play and um, spontaneous freedom. Continuing, Hoffer asserts, men never philosophize or tinker more freely than when they know that their speculation or tinkering leads to no weighty results. We are more ready to try the untried when what we do is inconsequential, right? So in a way, the kind of formal structure is a sort of burden. Hoffer continues, he says, hence the remarkable fact that many inventions had their birth as toys and such crucial instruments as the telescope and microscope were first conceived as playthings. Almost all civilizations display a singular ingenuity in toy making. And, and so like this invites us to look at our toys, look at our games, the kind of changing transformation of what we think is fun as a culture. I mean, playing video games, uh, maybe the board games are gonna make some kind of comeback. You know, m p playing sports, indeed. I mean, that, that, that kind of stuff is fun. And it, don't discount the arts and science as well. You know, there's this playful creativity in discovering new things. The whole idea of, music is that, you know, you do something new based on the old. It's playful. Hoffer continues, he says, the energies released by a crisis usually flow towards sheer action and application. Domestication could have been practiced as an amusement long before it found practical application. So again, he's, he's kind of centering on this idea of enjoyment, play, creativity, spontaneity, n not in sort of cloistered specific realms, but a kind of part of domestication itself. You know, you think of like work song and the, the playfulness in the home environment. Uh, in, in this first part, I think is important as well that, you know, in a crisis, you're not playful. That's what he's saying. You know, you need a kind of abundance to have play. But in a crisis, all of your energies are going to be directed towards fixing that particular issue. Offer continues, he says, when we do find that a critical challenge has apparently evoked a marked creative response, there's always the possibility that the response came not from people cornered by a challenge, but from people who in an exuberance, right, a great kind of 
what bursting of energy went out in search of a challenge. It is highly doubtful whether people are capable of genuine creative responses when necessity takes them by the throat. So again, this idea that you've got to be free to be playful, it, it can't be a function of just need. And the upshot of this is that we are creatures that have to sort of transcend our needs. And to do that, we enjoy through play Playful action. Hoffer continues, he says, the urgent search for the vitally necessary is likely to stop once we have found something that is more or less adequate, but the search for the superfluous has no end. The superfluous is the unnecessary. He's saying that there's no end to the unnecessary. You know, those things that we don't need, but we enjoy. And, you know, what would they be for you? I mean, f for me, there I have a million of these little enjoyments that I don't really need them, but my life would really lag if I didn't have one. Think, think for me, like having a cup of coffee or two every day, that's critical. I mean, my whole life changes if I don't have that. All right, Hoffer continues, he says, hence the fact that man's most unflagging and spectacular efforts were made not in search of necessities, but of superfluities. It is worth remembering that the discovery of America was a byproduct of the search for ginger, cloves, pepper, and cinnamon. The utilitarian device, utilitarian means right, resourceful, to, to use, right, you utilize. Utilitarian means of use. So he says, the utilitarian device, even when it is an essential ingredient of our daily life, is most likely to have its ancestry in the non-utilitarian. And I mean, what he's saying is here, like, what we think of as formal and necessary has grown out of the kind of uh, informal and what he calls the superfluous or the unnecessary and we can't distinguish like needs from wants i mean i think that's the basic argument here you know i mean to be happy we have to have our wants which you know i mean what does it mean to have uh you know basic food it means you know to be able to try all kinds of different food it's not not just you know we can't live on power bars every day even though that might give it you know we can't just have potatoes every day even though that might give us our calorie intake Hoffer continues, he says, one suspects that much of the praise of seriousness comes from people who have a vital need for a facade of weight and dignity. Like, like a facade is a false front. It's a kind of shallow, uh, deceptive characterization. It's, it's not real. It's a cynical shell. That's what a facade is. Uh, the fits of deadly seriousness we know as mass movements, which come bearing the message of serious purpose and weighty ideals, are usually set in motion by sterile pedants, possessed of a murderous hatred for festive creativeness. And, and so like a sterile pedant would be like, what, you know, an in impotent kind of true believer that is kind of supported or betrayed by dogma, you know. I, I don't think teacher is a good synonym um, for, for pedant in this, this instance. Hoffer continues, he says, such movements, and these would be like mass movements of, of murder and hatred, right? Like, like Nazism and, you know, the, the KKK, that, that kind of savagery. So such movements bring in their wake, meager mindedness, fear, austerity, and sterile conformity. Hardly one of the world's great works in literature, art, music, and pure science was conceived and realized in the stern atmosphere of a mass movement. It is only when these movements have spent themselves and their pattern of austere boredom begins to crack that the creative impulse begins to stir amidst the grayness and desolation. Offer continues, he says, my feeling is that the tendency to carry youthful characteristics into adult life, which renders man perpetually immature and unfinished, is at the root of his uniqueness in the universe and is particularly pronounced in the creative individual. Right, and that's fascinating in its own right. He's kind of saying here that, you know, the, the, the sort of creative person has to be a perpetual juvenile, can never really grow up, you know, a kind of never ending Willy Wonka, I guess. 
right? <clears throat> Hoffer continues. He says, youth has been called a perishable talent, but perhaps talent and originality are always aspects of youth. And the creative individual is an imperishable juvenile, right? So uh, talent and originality are the kind of what pivotal aspects of youth, right? Uh, always creative, right? To be to, to be a kid is to make stuff up in ways that adults lose that capacity. Although there are some adults who can kind of keep it going. <clears throat> Offer continues. He says, when the Greeks said, "Whom the gods love die young," they probably meant, as Lord Sankey suggested, that those favored by the gods stay young till the day they die young and playful. 